Our first speaker this morning is Iho Lamishka, uh, who is from the Mount Sinai uh, Medical School, School of Medicine, and who is the head of their uh, stem cell biology program. Uh, Iho um, got his PhD and his postdoc, did his postdoc at MIT with uh, Phil Sharp for his PhD and, and with Mulligan uh, as a postdoc, and then came to Princeton University I just heard 21 years ago, it seems like just yesterday, but 21 years ago um, uh, as an assistant professor and rose up the ranks of to a professorship. And during that period of time, he continued his work on hematopoietic stem cells and has developed into one of the real pioneers in this particular uh, area. And so it's a, a very special pleasure to be able to introduce Ihor, who's going to talk about dissecting cell fate and uh, regulation in stem cells, ER. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction, and uh, uh, it's an honor and a true pleasure to be here. And uh, it's interesting to hear Arnie say that stem cell biology has only come into its own in the last three or four <laughs> years. And I mean, it makes me wonder what I was working on for the, the other 18 years. Uh, but what I'd like to talk to you about today and maybe give you a sense of what we're, uh, what we're doing is kind of how stem cell biology has been moving forward and merging, in effect, with uh, other disciplines, uh, in particular systems biology. And what I'll tell you about today is uh, systems thinking about stem cell systems and essentially our efforts to derive regulatory networks and blueprints, epigenetic and genetic blueprints, that actually drive the biology of stem cells. Now, uh, being the first speaker, uh, I can introduce stem cells, and this is my one and only, I think, stem cell introduction slide, and it's really quite simple that there are two, and really only two, fundamental and canonical properties of stem cells that one needs to understand. And first of all, all stem cells have the ability to balance self-renewal and differentiation commitment uh, events. Uh, this is the fundamental cell fate decision that a stem cell has to make. And at least in some stem cell systems, uh, hematopoiesis, in particular blood formation, uh, single stem cells have the ability to produce very, very large clones of differentiated progeny throughout adult life. Uh, so these are the properties we want to understand. And uh, I think in order to understand these properties, I think one can rephrase the problem and cast it in this way, that really the challenge is to A, define the molecular and cellular state of a stem cell, and moreover, to then, having defined that state, to ask how does this state change during the execution of a decision, a cell fate decision. And I will argue that this goes beyond the, nas the usual traditional one gene, uh, one protein experimental paradigm, and furthermore, this requires novel and experimentally tractable technologies as well as uh, tractable stem cell systems. Now, where we'd like to be in the stem cell field is illustrated here, and, and this is now an old, from 2002, a wiring or a circuit diagram of all the regulatory events uh, that occur in the first 24 hours post-fertilization of a sea urchin embryo to, in to essentially specify the cell domains that are going to give rise to the mesoderm and the endoderm. Now, uh, this is a very complicated diagram, and it's probably true that we will have similar complexity in mammalian uh, stem cell systems and, in fact, in all developmental systems. So really, the challenge then is to elucidate not only a wiring diagram of which proteins regulate which genes, but also then to examine how this program and how the wiring diagram actually changes during the course of time after initiating a cell fate decision process. Now, I will most of my years in, in Princeton, uh, the 
the 21 or so. It is hard to believe that it was 21 years ago, uh, although I did have more hair. Arnie, Arnie has kept most of his, so you must know something about stem cells that I don't. Uh, but so we worked for a long time on hematopoietic or bone marrow stem cells, and we still work on hematopoietic stem cells. But today I'd like to tell you about our efforts using embryonic stem cells because they're more of an experimentally tractable system. Um, now, just a quick introduction to embryonic or ES cells. Uh, these cells are uh, they're pluripotent. They can cell, they're derived from an early blastocyst stage of a mammalian embryo, uh, mouse or human more recently. And these cells can be propagated indefinitely under very defined conditions in vitro. So one can maintain their pluripotent undifferentiated state essentially forever. And then using a variety of in vivo or in vitro situations, one can get these cells to differentiate and in fact they will produce all 220 or so cell populations typical of a mature adult, as adult organism as well as contribute to the germline. So really one of the challenges in stem cell biology, embryonic stem cell biology, is to control and direct the differentiation of these cells into cell populations that are actually useful for medical purposes. And this is really what all the hype is all about in terms of regenerative medicine. And I'll, I'll end my talk with giving you some flavor of uh, novel approaches to direct this. Uh, now, over the last 20 or so years, much has been learned uh, largely through the work of Austin Smith's lab, uh, Rudolf Janisch's lab, uh, other, many other laboratories, much is known about what controls pluripotency in mouse embryonic stem cells. So there are two signaling inputs that come from the outside. Uh, LIF activating the GP130 STAT3 signaling pathway and BMP4 activating the SMAD transcriptional pathway. So these two inputs are both necessary and importantly sufficient to maintain pluripotency of mouse ES cells in completely chemically defined media. Now, these two inputs impact on a triad of transcription factors that all interact, the OCT4, SOX2, and NANOG. And as I'll show you later, these act to both repress and to activate batteries of genes that mediate further downstream events, uh, whether pluripotency or commitment to cell fate. Now, more recently, it has been shown by Austin Smith's lab that one can, in fact, dispense with these signals and simply inhibiting the activities of ERK-1-2 and GSK-3-beta is sufficient to maintain pluripotency in these cells. And this has led to a model that Austin refers to as division without decision, namely that pluripotency may in fact be a default state that is, is simply resistant to uh, signals mediating uh, cell fate decisions. So we'd like to understand how this works and what my lab has been doing is, I won't go through all of this, but essentially we began by asking, in addition to the three transcription factors that I mentioned a minute ago, uh, we wanted to identify the entire complement of gene products that are necessary for pluripotency of embryonic stem cells. We wanted to do this rapidly on a genome-wide level. And for this, we adopted the inhibitory RNA or short hairpin technology. And we identified or assayed the activity or the importance of 70 transcription factors uh, in terms of their role in pluripotency. Now, in order to select these, we simply differentiated embryonic stem cells. These are undifferentiated ES cell colonies. They grow very tightly. They're purple uh, in, in this slide because they've uh, been stained for alkaline phosphatase activity, a marker. And after differentiation, they adopt a, uh, a different morphology, lose alkaline phosphatase. And in fact, if one does RNA expression, experiments, one can show that this gene product nanog that's required for pluripotency goes away 
at, with very rapid kinetics. So we adopted this system and simply asked, uh, can we identify other genes that are turned off as the cells begin to transition away from a pluripotent state into one or another pathway of differentiation? Uh, so we did a time course microarray experiment, identified 900 or so genes, and from these we selected 70 that encoded transcription factors or at least DNA binding proteins. And, and uh, the, the rationale for this was that we were primarily interested in transcription networks, but one could have just as easily selected signaling molecules as well as other things. Now, uh, we adopted an RNAi inhibitory RNA approach uh, delivered via a lentiviral uh, vector delivery system, and this is quite a simple uh, lentiviral vector where one has the short hairpin cassette here that targets one or another of each of these 70 genes, and downstream of that one simply has, in this case, a green fluorescent uh, marker that allows you to measure the uh, effect of the transduction procedure on ES cells. Now, this is a, a very robust method. It's quite easy to transduce uh, essentially 100 percent of a target cell population. Now, the next thing that we did was developed a quick assay system to measure effects on pluripotency. So what we wanted to know was are these, each of these, is each of these 70 genes required for maintaining a self-renewing pluripotent state? And for this, we adopted a rapid assay, taking advantage of a long-standing observation that uh, ES cells, when they're undifferentiated, divide with a kinetic of about 12 hours. As soon as they differentiate, they slow down to 24 hours. So this allowed us to develop a competition assay where we would mix in a four to one ratio, ES cells transduced with the short hairpin uh, representing one or another, targeting one or another of these genes. These are green cells because of the vector. And we mix these with wild type unmanipulated cells and put the mixture in culture. Now, if a gene product was necessary for self-renewal, then removing it would in, in addition to promoting differentiation, would cause the cell cycle to slow down, and these cells would be outcompeted by the unmanipulated cells over time. And in fact, if you target OCT4 or NANOG or SOX2, that's exactly what you see here. Each of these bars is, represents a, a day or two in uh, interval in culture. And we identified out of the 70 a number of different gene products previously not known to be important in maintaining pluripotency. Now, uh, those of you who are paying attention would argue that, of course, if you remove a generic component of the cell cycle machinery, you'd get the same phenotype, and of course that's true. Uh, but this was a, a quick assay, and of course we went further, and we developed the following system to begin studying what each of these 70 genes, or, or the ones that we identified that are important, how are they actually working? So we developed a rescue strategy where we modified the vector, and we're showing, I'm showing you the case of Nanog here. Here's the short hairpin cassette, which targets the three prime untranslated region of the endogenous Nanog mRNA. Uh, and downstream of that, on the same vector, we, under artificial tetracycline control, we put a RNAi immune version of the nanog coding region that is now lacking the short hairpin target site. So in the presence of doxycycline, uh, these cells should self-renew because you've taken away the endogenous nanog, but you've replaced it with a version of nanog that is artificially controlled. Now, in the absence of doxycycline, you have no source of nanog protein, and therefore these cells should differentiate. And we did this similar uh, strategies for all of the genes that we identified, and I'm only going to show you the example of nanog. So here are control cells, and here are the cells engineered with this vector. So in the presence of doxycycline, these cells are self-renewing by morphology. Uh, in the absence of doxycycline, they differentiate. 
Uh, we did all the appropriate controls. And most importantly, these cells now can give rise to fully viable chimeras, and they contribute to the germline. So we, we've engineered these cells, taking away an endogenous gene product that's required for a cellular state, and replaced it with a version that we can flip on and off in a robust manner with a small compound. Uh, now, among other things, this also rules out the, uh, the activity of, or the presence of any significant off-target effects that are, uh, in some cases, at least a problem with RNAi approaches. So having this type of system now where we can flip a single gene product on and off with a small compound now allows us to do some interesting experiments. So this is to orient you. This is a cartoon of all of the early uh, binary type developmental decisions that happen during mammalian embryogenesis. So you start with a morula, which is essentially a ball of undifferentiated cells. The very first decision that's made is you segregate the trophectoderm lineage, which will become the placenta, from a lineage of cells called the inner cell mass. The, the inner cell mass then goes on to segregate into the epiblast, and the epiblast population is the business end of the embryo, giving rise to the entire mature adult organism. Uh, and the other uh, lineage from the inner cell mass is primitive endoderm here. Now, the point in purple here are markers that are diagnostic for each of these different differentiation decisions. So using our system then, we could very quickly measure the expression levels of each of these and get a good picture of what type of differentiation these cells are undergoing as a function of a controlled removal of a single gene product one at a time. And this is the, the, how the experiment goes. It's quite straightforward. We take these cells here, and we simply remove doxycycline and then doing uh, quantitative PCR. Here we're looking at three marker genes that are diagnostic for early mesodermal lineage commitment. And you can see that over time, each of these three markers goes up and then down uh, as, as might be expected. So using this system, uh, we measured all 35 or so of the marker genes. And I'll just show you one example here where we've looked at markers that are diagnostic for ectodermal commitment differentiation as well as commitment and differentiation into the neural crest population. So here's the NANOG. Uh, rescue clone, and here are all of the other ones here that we've engineered in a similar way, removing the endogenous gene product and replacing it with an, an RNAi immune version that we can flip on and off with a small compound. So the take-home message here is that the differentiation programs are very complex, and this is true not only for these lineages but for the other lineages that we've, we've measured using this system. Now, one thing that I'll draw your attention to is the differences between these profiles after removing NANOG or OCT4 or SOX2. And you can see that there are some similarities, but there are also big differences in levels and in the kinetics with which these markers are turned on. Now, the reason this is interesting is because, it, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll mention again a little later, these three gene products have been strongly suggested to work together as a triad to up or down regulate target genes. And here we're showing that the situation is likely to be much more complex because each of these seems to have not, in addition to working together, also individual gene-specific or protein-specific functions. Now, the other thing that this allowed us to do, and in particular because these are transcription factors, was to ask what happens genome-wide in terms of global gene expression as a function of time after flipping on or off one particular gene pr transcription factor at a time. And one can see here that one, and these are time courses after removing NANOG or OCT4 or SOX2 as well as these other molecules, and you can measure and identify many genes that are down-regulated as well as many genes that are up-regulated. And, and for those of you who do these types of things, 
Uh, obviously, you can cluster these experiments or these data in many different ways. And, and really the key is, as Arne alluded to, is how do you actually extract meaningful biological information from these types of data sets? Uh, this is one pattern that we identified, and this is a, a more specific pattern now showing shared changes of genes upregulated or downregulated in, uh, after removing nanog, og4, or SOX2, and, and a very different pattern that results in removing each of these other ones. But again, the challenge is to extract meaningful information. So how does one do this? So one way of doing this is as follows. So these are the expression data now clustered or uh, parsed to only look at transcription factors. So these are transcription factors which uh, even I can't identify here, but just trust me, they're all transcription factors and they all have a property that they are turned on after removing NANOG or OCT4 or SOX2 or any of these other ones. So, so really the only feature here is that these are transcriptional regulators that are upregulated as a consequence of removing one or another other transcription factor that is required for pluripotency. So this then allowed us to do sort of a quasi-epistasis experiment and one can ask then if these are upregulated after taking away NANOG, for example, then if they're functionally important for promoting differentiation, then expressing these molecules in wild-type ES cells should drive differentiation, and that would then put this molecule downstream of NANOG and would make it a candidate for being repressed by NANOG. And in fact, one can do these experiments quite easily. This is a uh, proof of principle experiment where here we used an ES cell line engineered to express green fluorescence protein from the NANOG promoter. So when these cells are green, are, they are pluripotent. And here if we put in CDX2, a known transcription factor that drives differentiation toward troph ectoderm, you can see that the NANOG pluripotency reporter shuts off. So what we did is we tested uh, all 50 of the transcription factors that I showed you on the previous slide or two slides ago. The only feature of these transcription factors is that, that they were turned on after removing one or another pluripotency factor. And out of these, we identified 17 or so that in fact do have the property that one would suggest that if one now expresses these in a constitutive manner in wild type BL cells, they are sufficient to promote differentiation and one can then argue that these are somehow linked or repressed either directly or indirectly by the pluripotency machinery. So this is one example of how one can take these array data further and begin to try to make biological sense out of them. And, and putting all of our data together uh, from this first part, we've come up with this model here of how pluripotency is maintained, that not only do you require this triad of factors, but we've suggested that these four here form a separate axis that controls pluripotency, these two interact. And of course, models are only good uh, depending on how many predictions they make, and clearly these models, this model makes a bunch of predictions and we're currently testing many of these. So I'll switch gears now and tell you about two very interesting, or to me interesting, but and very new stories. And here we're actually taking a microscopic approach. Previously I've told you about the telescopic global approaches. Here we're focusing on NANOG. And what we want to know is how does NANOG actually do what NANOG does in terms of maintaining pluripotency. So two new stories. So as I mentioned earlier, from Rudolf Janisch's and Rick Young's and Laurie Boyer's work primarily, uh, it's been shown that these three factors, OCT, SOX, and NANOC, form a triad that both they reg upregulate themselves, they upregulate each other, and in fact these three gene products co-occupy on the chromatin or in the genome, they co-occupy in many cases the same promoter and regulatory regions of target genes. So there's 350 or so. And it's been suggested that this co-occupancy here both drives in a positive manner 
Uh, other genes required for pluripotency, but also, perhaps more importantly, represses regulatory genes that drive commitment and differentiation to different lineages. Uh, now, this is a model, it's a, a very intellectually gratifying model, but I should say that many of these predictions have, in fact, not yet been tested. Now, when we did our time courses of removing NANOG or OC4 or SOX2, one of the things we noticed in the genome-wide transcriptome experiments was that, in fact, uh, four clusters of genes that are either down-regulated or up-regulated as a function of time after removing each of these individually, that these four clusters were identical regardless of whether you took away NANOG, OX, or SOX2. And these data are very consistent with the chromatin localization data. And these would argue that these are the genes that are in fact co-regulated by this triad of transcription factors working together. Now, what we wanted to do first was to develop a way to ask, well, what controls NANOC? And what we wanted to know was, is there something upstream that mediates the expression of NANOC? And we wanted to develop a quick way to, to identify uh, positive as well as negative regulators of the NANOC gene. So for this, we developed a quick uh, transient assay system using synthetic hairpins, chemically synthesized hairpins. We developed an embryonic stem cell line that drives, as I mentioned earlier, that ha it drives the exp where green fluorescent protein is expressed from the NANOG promoter. Uh, we worked out ways of in transfecting the synthetic hairpins into these cells in a very robust manner. And we then put the cells under a variety of differentiation conditions. In this case, uh, I'll show you examples from retinoic acid. And, and two days later, simply by doing flow cytometry, one can measure the, what effect taking away one or another gene product actually has on the expression of this reporter molecule. Now, we tested a short hairpin library representing 350 genes with two hairpins apiece, and this was kind of a, a usual suspect library where we identified uh, various epigenetic regulators, uh, various transcription factors, signaling molecules, and I'll show you some of the results we've obtained here, and, and in one case, something that we think is very interesting. So here's the way the experiment goes. We take the short hairpin, put it into reporter line, dif induce differentiation here, and then 48 hours do flow cytometry. Now, in an unmanipulated case with retinoic acid, over time, the green fluorescence decreases. Now, if one knocks down gene X here, that's required in a positive way for promoting differentiation or, say, shutting down NANOG, then one would expect the degree of green to remain on over time here. And it, conversely, if one takes away a gene, uh, gene product here, right, that enhances the differentiation procedure here, then one, or, or blocks differentiation uh, then one would see an increase in uh, the kinetics of GFP decrease. So here are proof of principle experiments. If we have a synthetic hairpin targeting the GFP transcript, one can see that green fluorescence goes away more rapidly. In the middle here are the, what the kinetic, the, the this is the, the wild type case with no hairpin. And of course, if you take away NANOG, if you take away OC4, you also increase the rate at which the, this reporter uh, molecule or construct goes away. Similarly, in the opposite case, if you take away components of the retinoic acid receptor complexes, one can block the decrease of the reporter. So we identified what we call 46 enhancers of NANOG expression and 33 repressors. And, and by using these terms, these are operational. I don't mean that these are direct enhancers or direct repressors. Uh, these fall into interesting categories. So some of the usual suspects that we identified in our previous screen or that others have identified that are required in a positive way for maintaining a pluripotency showed up here as well. Uh, and this is a summary of this. Now, uh, 
I'll tell you now a very interesting story that we've actually taken a bit further. So we identified in, in our panel, we had a series of gene products called SMARCA. And what these are are components of the SWI sniff chromatin remodeling complexes. And these come in two flavors. There's the Brahma or the Barge 1 flavor. And what we found was that in every case here, in 10 separate cases, taking away one or another component of the Barge 1 complex, not Brahma, resulted in a blockage to differentiation of the ES cells. Uh, we confirmed this by looking at the pluripotency protein. So here's uh, Western blots looking at Nanog, OC4, and SOX2. And it, in this case, if you take away SMARCA E1 or SMARCA C1 uh, and induce differentiation, you can show that the differentiation is blocked. And in fact, you sustain the expression of these pluripotency reporters. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you differentiate with retinoic acid or with other stimuli. Here, we're using a condition to promote neural differentiation developed by Austin Smith's lab. We can show that taking away the swi sniff complex blocks differentiation in this case. Uh, using uh, markers for neural, mesodermal, or endodermal differentiation, we can actually show that taking away SMARCA seems to be a general results in a general block to differentiation. Now, we've taken this further and done a lot of experiments that I don't have time to go into detail about, but we've shown that SWI sniff is actually physically located uh, on the regulatory regions of OCT4, NANOG, SOX2, as well as ZIK3 and KLF4, two other molecules that form the pluripotency circuit. We've shown that taking away SWI sniff uh, and inducing differentiation uh, results in maintenance of expression of this circuit. And this has allowed us, uh, allowed us to form a model where we would suggest that SWI sniff is actually fundamentally important in collapsing or disassembling the pluripotency network uh, during a cell fate, uh, a commitment decision to essentially any cell fate by ES cells. And uh, this is our uh, sort of crude attempt at now putting a bunch of the stuff that I told you together in a very sort of very simple-minded Eric Davidsonian type circuit model where I've told you that OCT4, SOX2, and NANOC both positively regulate themselves as well as regulate each other. There are some other inputs here that emerged from our own work that I told you about a bit ago. Uh, we have evidence, as I mentioned, that, s that why SNF is important in collapsing this network here by physically repressing or mediating repression of at least these four gene products. Uh, other work that I don't have time to go into uh, shows that STAT3 and SMAD4 are actually directly activating the KLF4 gene product. So this is, I think, where pluripotency circuitry stands so far uh, in, in the literature and from unpublished work. So where do we go from here? And for the next five minutes or to end, I'll show you what we're doing to actually, again, look at what NANARG does. But what we'd like to know is what happens at multiple levels, right, in the cell, multiple molecular and biochemical levels, as a function of time after introducing a defined perturbation, in this case, taking away NANARG. So I'll show you some experiments where we take away NANARG and then look at changes over time in chromatin structure, looking at histone modifications, actual transcription by looking at the localization of elongating RNA polymerase II genome-wide, looking at uh, the transcriptome, and most interestingly, looking at the entire nuclear proteome as a function of time after removing one particular gene, pr nuclear gene product. Now, for this, again, the, the cell lines that we developed where we can r flip nanog on and off uh, with a small compound have been very useful. Uh, I'll skip this part here. 
uh, and simply go here. These are nuclear proteomic data at day one, day three, and day five. After removing NANOG, we've looked at about 1,500 nuclear proteins. Uh, and you can cluster these and, in fact, show that there are many proteins, nuclear proteins, that go up or go down in levels, all as a function of removing NANOG. And I'll, I'll try to make some sense out of this in a minute. Now, um, our first experiments now have been the, the same experiment. We've been able to show changes in histone H3 acetylation. We've done methylation marked as, as well. Uh, looking at RNA pol 2 elongating, RNA pol 2 localization on the same uh, genomic locations, looking at transcript levels from the same genes, and finally looking at protein levels, again encoded by these mRNAs which come from these genes. Now, uh, there's a bunch of things that we've found from this, and some of them I think are, are uh, well, for somebody that's done a lot of transcriptome analysis, these were sobering observations to me. So first of all, this category here, these are nuclear proteins that go down at day five after removal of NANOG. These are proteins that go up, right? And if you look over here, there is no direct correlation whatsoever with the levels of transcript that encode these proteins. And this wouldn't have surprised me if this was 5% or 10% of the nuclear proteins, but this is 40% of the protein changes in the nucleus that we see. They are not accompanied by coordinate changes in the mRNAs that encode these proteins. Now, of course, there are cases, again, a sizable proportion where the mRNAs go down, the proteins go down, mRNAs go up, proteins go up. Cases where transcription goes up by looking at POL2, mRNAs go up, proteins go up. Uh, so you can parse these data in many ways, but this is really the, the, the biggest population here. So uh, to begin uh, analyzing these, it's, again, it's, it's important to be able to manipulate these data and to extract them quickly. So we've developed this tool here, where this is, these are, this is changes at day one, day three, day five after removal of NANOG. And if you just focus on these three panels here, this is a 20 by 20 matrix, and each pixel here represents a particular protein. So you can see that there are populations of proteins that are upregulated over time. There are populations that are downregulated over time. Uh, and focusing here, these are mRNAs that encode these proteins. So for the same pixel here, representing changes in mRNA, the same address here represents what's going on with the protein. And in fact, if you click on each of these pixels, one can rapidly extract uh, the genes, what gene you're looking at, and very quickly m extract out what happens to the pro This is uh, the case of NANOG here, so you can see NANOG protein goes down with time, and you can very quickly get a sense of what's happening at the RNA level encoding NANOG, what's happening with transcription. Now, one can also begin analyzing these data from a more interesting point of view. So here we've ordered the proteins that have changed over time, decreased after removal of NANOG. So of course, NANOG protein goes away. And we've ordered these from proteins that go down to proteins that go up. And here we've asked which of these proteins that go up or down as a function of taking away NANOG which represent known transcriptional targets of the NANOG transactivator. And you can see that a high percentage of the proteins, that the, the transcription factors that go down in level are in fact have been shown or suggested to be direct targets of NANOG. So useful biological information, one can then look at, extract the, the, these data and look at them more in more detail. A polycomb group gene products. Polycomb group is re responsible for repressing many targets. And one can ask uh, which polycomb group genes are downregulated or upregulated as a function of time after removal of NANOG. And then one can ask what's going on with the targets of these polycomb gene products. Again, one way of looking at useful information. And finally, uh, one can begin asking now in a more focused way, what's going on 
with this sub-circuit of pluripotency. So day zero, day one, day three, day five, after taking away NANOC, uh, the squares are at levels of nuclear proteins, the circles are mRNA levels, so you can show that day one, after removal of NANOC, the proteins go down, then uh, similarly over time, uh, and, and you can get a sense of kind of a flow of information here. So, uh, so again, a way of looking at this. Similarly, one can look at these data from a different point of view. This is an interactome derived from Stu Warkin's very elegant work and published in Nature, where Stuart's lab asked, can we identify proteins that are in complex with NANOC? So here's the interactome, and we asked, what happens to the, pro the members of this interactome if you take away NANOC. And you can see here that, in fact, in a large percentage of cases, if you take away NANOC, you also deplete or start losing levels of members of the NANOC interactome. Okay. Uh, okay, now in the last 30 seconds, I'm going to speculate. And what might the future bring? Where is this all going? And I'll try to be a little, give you an idea of something that might even be practical. And what I'll tell you about is efforts at engineering stem cells for regenerative medicine purposes. And this would represent to me an integration of stem cell biology and synthetic biology. And what I'll tell you about now are some data that are emerging from Ron Weiss's lab, a collaborator of mine uh, in, at Princeton University. So first of all, Yamanaka in Japan and Rudolf Janisch and others have shown similar things that remarkably it only takes three gene products to reprogram a mature adult cell, a fibroblast for example, into an embryonic stem cell or something that resembles it. So this represents a sea change in the way people are thinking about embryonic stem cells. Uh, in fact, it's quite easy. We've been doing this in our lab. And the nice thing about it is that one can now imagine taking a skin cell biopsy from an individual, from a patient, and very easily, of course, in this case, with genetic modification, which you don't want to do, but of course, there will be other ways of doing this. You can make an embryonic stem cell that's genetically identical to any individual. In particular, say, somebody who's a patient that is suffering from some debilitating disorder. Uh, this is easy. We've been able to do this in the human system in our lab. And what might one do with these? So here's where the synthetic biology comes in. And this is all from Ron's lab. So how might one develop a system to potentially treat, say, diabetes? So what one might want to do is to develop a way of maintaining a level of insulin-producing beta cells from an auto-regulated system of ES cells that balances or counterbalances the autoimmune destruction of these cells. Ron's lab has developed a sort of an engineering model of this where you can implant in theory, this is years away, but in theory, a population of engineered ES cells, which has circuitry that senses the level of insulin-producing cells in the body, when that drops due to autoimmune destruction, these cells are instructed to differentiate into more beta cells. When you restore the level of these cells to normal, the cells are instructed to stop differentiation. So essentially, an artificial tissue homeostasis system. And Ron's lab has modeled this and developed this, and th it's a complex system, will require at least 22 individual circuitry components. I'll show you some data that is very partial to this. And you can uh, draw this out as sort of a, a computer program here. Uh, in this case, it's controlled by docs. These are two sort of sub-circuits here where this module here impacts, directs the expression of an endoderm-specific cell fate regulator, which drives differentiation to endoderm. Once this is accomplished, you activate a second module, which expresses here uh, a cell fate regulator that might drive 
or promote the expression of islet cells. Uh, this is all modeled or monitored with uh, f different fluorescent markers. And remarkably, it actually works, where Ron's lab can drive the expression of endoderm in a totally artificial way. And moreover, to now put in this subcircuit, which actually reports the differentiation into something that resembles insulin producing islet cells. So this is all sort of in, in the future. Uh, this is my present affiliation. One of the uh, real treats about having moved from Princeton is that I, I'm really enjoying thinking about medicine and interacting with translational and clinical researchers, which was not easily possible here. Uh, and these are the people that did the work. Uh, these are people still from Princeton. Uh, this is the crew at Mount Sinai here. Uh, I'll mention collaborators Patrick Pattison with the Swai Sniff and the short hairpin screen, Tony Wetton, who is a collaborator that helps us or does the proteomics with us, uh, Olga Troyanskaya's lab, in particular Florian Markowitz, who's here, are involved in helping us analyze data. Ron Weiss's group, the synthetic biologists, and this is my dog, Coach. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions, and um, uh, please raise your hand and be recognized. We have a couple of people with microphones so that we can uh, hear the questions. And I can't see anybody with these lights. Uh, here's one. <laughs> Here is a beautiful work. Uh, I had one question uh, regarding the notion of quantitative and autoregulatory loops. Uh, the system is built uh, with the rescue uh, to remove both of those. And I was wondering, uh, has it turned up interesting results where you can see where you've removed the quantitative expression and the ability to have an autoregulatory loop to get insights into quantitation and autoregulatory loops? Yeah, uh, well, um, that's a, a point that's very well taken. So when, when we built these artificial systems, we were very careful to not overexpress, but to simply replace. So uh, when we take away replace endogenous nanog or oct4 say with exogenous it, it, the levels are the same but but you raise a really interesting point and quantitation is really sorely needed here and in fact a, a really terrific case in point is oct4 so if you have one x oct4 it's pluripotent if you have a half x oct4 you go trophectoderm if you have one and a half or two x oct4 you differentiate into primitive endoderm. So uh, I think it's a fundamental question of how a cell can actually count very narrow windows of something. And I would bet that a similar argument will be, the, the situation will be more common, and I don't think OX4 is the exception. I think it's likely to be the rule. So uh, how this works quantitatively uh, is difficult right now to answer. Um, I think one will be able to perhaps approach this by, you know, using systems where you can actually dial in very, very defined levels of something. But you're right. I mean, it's all first pass stuff right now. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. And the questions? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I think there's one right down here and then. I don't know where. It looks like. Uh, yes. Oh. Why don't we start here and then Joe? Okay. Just from the standpoint of translational me uh, <clears throat> medicine, I guess one caveat is that if one designs autoregulatory homeostatic loops, then as you said, you'll have a constant balance between inflammation, uh, auto destruction, and uh, 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 making new cells, which means you'll have a low level of inflammation going on, which is probably not a good thing. So that one might want to think more in terms of regulatory loops in the immune system. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, this is not meant to show you or suggest in any way, shape, or form that this is a system that's ready for prime time. Uh, it's meant to show that it, it can be done in principle, but you're absolutely right, and, and I'm glad you asked that question because uh, just a plug for stem cell research and translational medicine in general. Uh, we hear a lot about stem cells being used for so-called so cell replacement therapies, and this may be true 
10 years from now. But I would argue that the, the real benefits from stem cell research, and in, in, in particular, the iPS patient-specific cells or disease-specific cells, is not going to be that. It's going to come from developing, using these cells as a way to study the etiology of complex diseases. So, for example, if you make cells from a Parkinson's patient, for example, or you know uh, many other diseases uh, that have genetic or can have genetic components, then, then having a system in vitro where you can actually step by step get the cells to differentiate to, in this case, dopamine producing neurons might give you a way to identify, well, where does the lesion first happen in a defined cellular system? And if, if you do that, you have A, better diagnostics in principle, and B, a way to potentially screen compounds or drugs or, or something. So I think that's going to be the real benefit here. You know, the, the regenerative medicine cell transplantation will come, but I, I I don't think that'll be the major impact. Uh, your dissociation in some as in some areas between RNA and protein uh, suggests that you're going to have to look at microRNAs now as your next uh, goal. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, we've actually we're doing that. I mean, we, we we've also profiled what happens to microRNA expression as a function of taking away nanox. So, so we have these data, um, and we haven't integrated them with the rest of the stuff, but you're absolutely right that you know, some of the proteins that change in pr at the protein level and not at the encoding mRNA level are likely to be regulated by microRNAs, and that's obviously something that we're going to look at, and Kurt, I think, will tell you more about that. Thank you.